The lesson is the second chapter of the Gospel of John. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Here ends the lesson. Please be seated. I had to promise not to mention any body parts before they left me <laughs> come back to the pulpit. <clears throat> Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. One fine day in Cana, God interrupted a perfectly decent wedding and must have had a good reason for doing so. After all, he invented the wedding and took delight in such things. And it appears as if he was reluctant to interrupt. He says it is not yet his hour. But nevertheless, when his mother gave him no rest, interrupt, he certainly did. It wasn't the first time either that God had done such a thing. The Lord seems to have a habit of interrupting. I can't keep silent, says the prophet, over and over today, Isaiah 62. I, I can't keep silent, picking up Isaiah's mantle again. You see, back in Babylon, when they were not yet in Jerusalem, the prophet kept saying, you, you don't see Jerusalem but we live there by hope. And now when we arrive back in Jerusalem, the prophet must pick up the mantle again and say, what you see is not what will be. What you are seeing now in the streets of Jerusalem is not what the Lord is going to bring. And he not only invites, but coaxes and, and perhaps uh, even uh, bothers the Lord into interrupting. Anytime you want to make this the highest of all mountains, go right ahead, Lord, because it isn't right now. What we see is not what will be. Augustine once said, we, we are more where we love than where we live. We are people who sit on the edge of our seat in tense hope, like a spring coiled. And this God is always ready to interrupt. Then came the promise, like an invader. You've got new names coming, you know. Not the ones the world has been calling you, like Shimama, roughly translated bachelor farmer, old maid. No, we've got better names coming yet. Hepzibah, from God's own lips. Beulah. Oh, what beautiful names these are. It's worth taking Hebrew over. <laughs> Just to say these words that come out of the mouth of God himself. These names are names that you will be called. Hepzibah, my delight is in you. Beulah, Mary. And these are the names that you will have. Who wouldn't want to take Hebrew a final time from Limburg just to say that? I can't keep silent about these names. You may live in a trailer park and run down Jerusalem now and want to be anywhere but here. You may go out some night and say, why did I shave my legs for this? But God is going to be your husband. 
You're finally getting your bail back. The Lord, and with such a husband, oh boy, the estate. I hear tell talk of a mansion with many rooms. For in marriage, an exchange of goods takes place. And anyone around this God long enough to know what he says is so. And if God calls you Beulah, then so you are. My little ruffian friends and I had a game round about the time of a Johnny Cash hit. We would wrestle the weakest among us down in Darwinian style until he called himself Sue. <laughs> well, God is not above entering into a little game of survival of the fittest with you. He likes his odds and he's willing to pin down in order for you to call yourself by this name, Beulah. And if I can be of any help this morning pinning you down, so be it. <laughs> God was making himself a bride of Israel again. She may not in good conscience have been able to wear white for the wedding, but a bride she would be. And you'll take whatever you can get when you're pinned down, and you'll take the name Beulah. Now imagine my feeling, a Gentile, like a Ninevite, who doesn't know his right hand from his left, who was not worthy of so much as a little word from this God, who has stood outside the dance all these years, hit on by every sleazy bale in the juke joint, <laughs> but no Yahweh. But I, I can't keep silent because I've been claimed out of the house of the rising sun by one Jesus Christ. I can't keep silent about that. I, I know the difference between Minnesota and Israel. I'm aware of this. I've been to Jerusalem and St. Paul is no Jerusalem. I understand that. I know something about this 21st century and I know it's not the first century, but I know something else. My Jesus keeps whispering sweet nothings in my ear. You are my beloved. With you I am well pleased. And I can't keep silent about this one. I cannot keep silent about Jesus Christ. Even though everywhere I look, I see trouble. Trouble in the church, trouble in your lives, trouble in the land. Imagine my glee at the trouble stirred up by President Clinton's pardons. I've lived for this moment. <laughs> Why is it that pardons make the righteous so mad? <laughs> Three cheers for Clinton, who I'm finally assured has really read his Bible all the way up to Luke chapter 16. And he knows that when a wicked steward is about to be judged, the best thing to do is turn around and pardon those around you so you have a place to run. <laughs> he understands something about the crazy economy of mercy. And in the crazy economy of mercy, the righteous are always running around offended at pardons. But for the sinner, it's sheer bliss. The church, too, has Christ as Baal, a loving husband, but not because she is so lovely in herself. The church is wed to Christ not when she is displaying her splendor to the world, but when she is sitting at the feet of her Christ, listening to his word until she can't keep silent any longer, finally convinced in her faith's heart that she, you and I, are Christ's Beulah, it was for this purpose that a perfectly good wedding was interrupted for what John called a sign. Now a sign reveals glory. And glory has to be revealed because God's glory in this old world is hidden. Whether in the ruined streets of Jerusalem or the little hills of Cana, it is hidden and needs to be revealed. But there that day, the Holy Spirit was revealing the Son of Righteousness to us, preparing to make Israel and the afterthoughts grafted into the vine 
like you and me, into his bride once and for all. But to get us to the altar for such a wedding is hard work, and only God himself is capable of such patience, such love, and finally, the dying it takes. About that first wedding, that day in Cana, we know almost nothing. We don't know what the bride wore. We don't know how many groomsmen there were. We don't know the rabbi's name. We don't know if the infant ring bearer stole the show. We don't know if they sang, we've only just begun. <laughs> we don't know if they made their own sappy vows. But we can be sure of one thing. Whatever those vows were, they had to conclude with one form or another of till death do us part. But you see, God was doing a remarkable thing that day by interrupting this wedding. He was making faith in his son where there was none. He was planting hope that was not bound even by death. He was underway to make real lovers of people who had barely scratched the surface. And there at Cana, God was consummating his marriage with Israel and finding a way through to Gentile sinners by giving himself in the Son. He was finding a way to give all that he has and all that he is to an undeserving bride. And that is a remarkable thing. To love the unlovable. For that, God must do a strange work. The steward at the wedding points it out for us. Everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. The steward is not amazed at a magic trick. No doubt he's been to plenty of bar mitzvahs with a magician. He is interested and perplexed, however, by Jesus playing the fool. Who serves good wine to drunk people? It's like taking your finest Chardonnay to spring break. Who does that? <laughs> it's as wasteful, uh, it is wasteful if you're a home economist. It is casting pearls before swine if you're a connoisseur. The steward is not amazed by magic, he is nonplussed by the economy of mercy. But you have kept the good wine until now. A sinner always does this, looks right through the things given for something more. To stare at the gift Jesus is offering of his own self as groom and wondering what trick he must have up his sleeve. What secret purpose must he be concealing? What does he want from me, after all? But John says it right out. He is not hiding. He is revealing glory. God, God's search for a bride seems infinitely problematic. After all, what is God to do when no one finds him appealing? Or when all go looking for better bales? What is God to do when his lovers look right past him occupied by the simplest nonsense. Meanwhile, the glory of the Lord passes by without notice. What do you do with people to you, whom you have plighted your eternal troth, and they look at you as if you have handed them a dead fish? Such a marriage seems infinitely troubled from the start, but right at the end of our lesson is the real miracle of Cana. His disciples believed in him. Faith was made where there was none. But when this word found its hearers in the disciples so they believed in him, when they took on this amorous groom, what then does our new groom do? The very next thing we find is that Jesus runs off, dragging his bride with him to Passover, overturning tables and whipping out the money changers from the temple. Some honeymoon this is going to be. <laughs> Sweetie pie, where's the cruise? Love muffin, how about a time in the Hamptons? I have a feeling this is going to be a strange wedding. For the glory of the Lord appears as cross in this old world, and the cross appears as anything but glory, so that what God is up to in this wedding is going to be a strange ride. 
How did we find ourselves in this situation? Puzzling over a Jesus who does things backward and plays the fool. The best wine when the party goers are drunk. The father giving away his son in a marriage to a bride that must be the last choice a father could ever want. No good job, no good prospects, a loser in every way, carefully having stored up a dowry of sin, death, and the devil, and offering it up as if it were sweet perfume. <laughs> in love with a law that she has never once kept, well, how did we get here? He interrupted with a promise. That's how we got here. In the strange economy of mercy, he takes Israel as, a, as his bride and finds a way to the nations through her. And how does he do it? Many have noted that Jesus deals harshly or strangely with his mother, but she's not exempt from faith. She needs a word too, and she knows how to wring it out of him. <laughs> Take no rest, give him no rest until you get this word and this promise. She obviously has been around him enough to know that when he says something, so it is. So she leans over to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. And there's your promise to the Gentiles and to the Jews in the form of a mother's advice. He may be unpredictable, but do what he says. If he says, take the jars and, and, and fill them with water, go ahead and do what he says. If he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will rebuild it, I wouldn't bet against it. If he says, take up your cot and walk, I would advise doing so. If he says, go down to the pool and wash, it's worth your time. If he says, feed my sheep, then I would advise doing so. If he says, your sins are forgiven, take him at his word. And if he says, finally, one day, you finding yourself in a grave, stinking and rotten, and you hear Jesus Christ say, come out, then I would advise you, do as he says. Sleeper, awake, for the bridegroom has come. He has called you his Beulah. And when he calls you Beulah, so you are. Write it on your name tag. Send it out to the world. Call me Beulah. For, for my name is given by this God in Jesus Christ. And I take him at his word. If he wants to say with this word, I thee wed, then ask for no prenuptial agreement. Take the estate and run. Give him yours, take his, and go. He has called you Beulah, and so you are. Do what he says. You can't keep silent with this name. And if you are befuddled, if you are shy, if you are retiring, if you are uncertain about the world and this mission that Christ has sent you on, now we have given you your opening line to the world. Call me Beulah and let it fly. Amen.